In this video, we're talking with Brandon Poole, a detection engineer and longtime professional SOC analyst about the actual job of the SOC analyst and what it's like out there in the trenches doing that work. Specifically, we're talking about red team script kitties, ransomware as a service, blue team script kitties, the challenge of detection engineering, and what is some of the critical problems in the industry coming up. Hey everybody, welcome to Simply Cyber. So, some of you may remember a couple months ago I did a video with Brandon Poole called Sock Life. It's it's right here, you can or right there, you can check it out. It was awesome. And we talked with Brandon about what is the real deal of the sock analyst day-to-day -day life in you know the modern sock today's world i was going back through the content and i realized there's another awesome segment of content and i carved it out and i've put it here as basically sock life 2. brandon tells us about how threat actors can be script kitties and complete and like what their operations actually look like so as a sock analyst when you find certain artifacts on an endpoint that's compromised you know that this is a script kitty also, he talks about a term I've never heard before called blue team script kitty, okay? He seems a little uh, reluctant when he shares it, but he explains what it is and explains how we can avoid blue team script kitties, right? He also goes in and does a fantastic job of explaining why machine learning, you know, modern next gen EDR AV uh, kind of solutions that use machine learning can actually be poisoned and how threat actors are doing that poisoning to destroy those models. It's brilliant. For those of you who are new here, this is Simply Cyber, the YouTube channel designed to help you make and take a cybersecurity career further, faster. And on this channel, we talk about offensive and defensive things and we interview experts just like Brandon. So if that's something that's interesting to you, I suggest you check out the other videos on the channel and definitely hit subscribe and the bell for notifications because I push a new video out every Every Monday at noon and I want you to be made aware as soon as it comes out. If you want you can use the minute markers below to jump to different parts of Brandon's talk but I really really uh, think you're going to enjoy listening to it throughout. He has such insight and he is such a just next level SOC engineer. In fact, he's moved beyond SOC engineer. He's a detection engineer. He is a master of tuning rules and um, he'll go into explaining how they uh, detect mini cats, for example, and it'll really reveal that you can't use signature based definitions for detecting these things. You really have to get the root of what a tool like mini cats in this example is actually doing on the system to you know, benefit the threat actor and then look for that type of behavior. Okay, so let's get into the interview. I hope you enjoy it. One case, like the threat actor pretty much like nuked all of Active Directory. So like they didn't have any tools. And I was like, well, let's push it with group policy. And they were like, well, we can't do anything with DC because everything's corrupt. Like you can't do anything. Oh. It's like, oh, gosh. So they actually went through and they uh, did sneaker net. So, you know, they had help desk and all the IT people running around with like USB drives and plugging in and whatnot. That sounds personal, by the way. Like that threat actor. It sounds like they were it, taking it personal. Yeah, well... I, some <laughs> so it depends on the threat actor. Um, with some, you know, this I've seen the news the news stories lately, and I 100% agree that this was the year of ransomware because ransomware was just rampant. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much like all of the cases we almost worked this year were ransomware with yeah. the exception of a handful. But uh, some of the ransomware actors, especially when it's like ransomware as a service, uh, the actors aren't necessarily competent, they they know how to like find these like, you know, dark web forums and they are able to like subscribe and say, Hey, I want to like sign up for your ransomware as a service thing. And some of these services, they actually give you like a word document. You don't have to know anything. It's just like, here's a word document. Go to show Dan, do this search, find people with open RDP, download this tool here, run this script. If you get in because they have a weak password, then you do X, Y, Z. And it's actually hilarious. I've worked like an incident response case before where they actually copy and paste it over like the Word document and the notepad document of the commands and the steps they need to follow. So some of these folks aren't actually even like technically competent. It's there's someone that is like maintaining the infrastructure and the code yeah. and stuff like that. That is. And then what happens is like, you know, they're doing some profit share, like the person actually going and doing all the exploitation and getting in might get like a 40 percent cut and the operator might get like a 60 or, you know, maybe it's the other way around where it's 60, 40 or 30 
70 or something like that. Yeah. Like some of these operators aren't even necessarily like competent. So like, it's not unusual to see them make like a mistake and like accidentally like cause damage that is not intended. Like, uh, you know, go through and accidentally muck something up and like just completely destroy like a domain control controller. Uh, yeah. The, the, the gap between script kitty and, you know, competent threat actor is getting more narrow because because of the i guess the availability of the tool set being made available to the script kitties at this point yeah i i, w I would agree with that um i would say that the, it, it's also <laughs> i'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this without like you know just putting a damper on the mood and everything that's going on in the world but really and truly like even a lot of your advanced threat actors, like they can still use a lot of these script kitty tools because people just don't have the defensive controls and the detective controls in place to like notify them. Right. So even like your advanced threat actors, like if you read through any of the APT reports and stuff like that, in some cases they're still using like, you know, PowerShell empire. And that's been around for like what going on like a decade now. Not quite a decade. Mm -hmm. I mean, like it, it's, it's an easy thing to detect. Uh, but you know, there there's still like lack lack of, you know, the ability to detect and stop it there for various reasons and whatnot. Yeah, really. And why would you burn a zero day if if, if yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, it's one it's one of those things. And if you push any like red teamer, they will even say, like, you know, uh, you know, Dave Kennedy's even talked about this, like they have like custom tooling, like they they release some of their some of their tool, tooling public, and they said like the stuff they release public gets picked up like that like defender gets all your major major av vendors get it people write signatures for it but a lot of the stuff that isn't made public just from the very nature of uh you know vendors like they're all about trying to get coverage they don't necessarily like care how they do it they just want to like mark that checkbox and a lot of times mm -hmm. like they make a very brittle rule that would detect that one thing and if they spend a little bit more time maybe like it would create more false positives maybe they you know the customers won't tolerate a false positive or if it's like an automatic like protection tool you can't create a whole lot of false positives because you're like doing a denial of service at that point in time if you're actually taking like an automated action on it mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, you know a lot a lot of those folks uh they'll have like custom tooling that does something very similar would be hard to detect that but uh those tools still go like undetected so i guess what i'm trying to say is that uh a lot of, yeah, the, the gap is, you can argue the gap is narrowing, but I would almost argue that there are, there is such a thing as blue team script kitties. <laughs> it's terrible as it is to say, there's a lot of people out there that just don't put like real thought into like defense in depth. Like they have weak controls or they make very brittle signatures or like they, they, they narrow things down like too much. And then like, you know, uh, one common tool for like Mimi cats there for a while is like you could use like invoke Mimi cats and it used to be you could go and you could remove all the comments from invoke Mimi cats and then it would run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's like, okay, so you actually didn't detect anything it was doing. It's just like, you were looking for some like signature there. Yeah. So, like a strings match. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's one of those things that's cat and mouse. And it's one of those things that, you know, there, there are a lot of good people. There's a lot of good initiatives out there trying to close that gap. So there aren't so many like, blue team script kitty organizations out there. So like red canary and the atomic red team, like going through and actually testing things. It, uh, it was amazing there for like the longest time because like you would run some of these atomic red team tests and they were actually pretty good. And like solutions would just completely and totally whiff on them, like just mm -hmm. not even detect them. And then, uh, you know, some of these, some of these folks would go and talk to like what these, these uh, vendors and these vent, they'd be like, well, you didn't detect, you know, this, this test I ran, and uh, some of the vendors actually went and they were just looking for uh, literally like keywords or certain things within like the Red Canary, like Atomic Red Team framework. So you'd go in and just make like a slight modification on the file and they wouldn't be able to detect it anymore. So I don't yeah, know. That, that's, um, I mean, that's gross. Like you like look under the, under the hood and it, you know, it's uh, there's not, there's like nothing there. It's just like a mouse on a wheel. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I feel, I, you know, as a vendor, I guess I do, I do feel for these guys. I'm, you know, that's kind of like why our approach at Soteria with our rule writing is a little different. Like, we're not necessarily writing signatures. We're not feeding into like next gen machine learning models because, like, all that stuff is very brittle. Mm -hmm. um, 
we write behavior based, like rules based off like behavior based heuristics. So we look at like parent child uh, relations or like, you know, popular one I want is like, how do you detect Mimi cats? So, you know, your AV vendors, they look for like certain hex strings and Mimi cats or, you know, whatnot. And the way we kind of distilled it is, you know, what, what is Mimi cats? Mimi cats is a binary that dumps stuff from LSAS. Well, how does it do that? Well, it makes certain Windows API calls in order to, with a certain access mask, in order to access that stuff from Mimi cats. So, you know, if you were to run Mimi cats on a Windows box, uh, the alert that would fire would be unsigned process. Uh, trying to remember the name of the rule. Unsigned process accessing LSAS. But the way that we actually look at it is the API calls you need to access that data in LSAS, you have to pretty much load certain DLLs up into like the uh, binary running in memory. So mm -hmm. like the process running in memory needs to access uh, Vault CLI uh, is one of them. And then the other one is samlib.dll. So those two DLLs there actually give you access to the underlying Windows API calls that you need in order to access the part in memory where the passwords and password hashes are stored. So the way that we design the rule is we look for something that is unsigned, loading Vault CLI and samlib DLL but then is also went opening a thread into LSAS. So it's talking to LSAS and boom, that catches me cats all day. You can rewrite it. Doesn't really matter because you, in order to access LSAS, you have to have like these very specific windows API calls that require these very specific DLLs. Now are there bypasses for that? Yeah, sure. Like one of them is just going through and just like signing, you know, Mimi cats because I just told you it was unsigned. Uh, yeah, sure, you can get around it that way, but we build our detection model where all of our detections overlap very narrowly, and they're mm -hmm. kind of narrow focused. So even if you sign like Mimi Cats there, we have other things in place to look for that type of behavior to catch uh, Mimi Cats in other ways. Uh, you know, because you can use PowerShell, but guess what? PowerShell, you can do kind of the same thing. PowerShell normally doesn't talk to LSAS, so I can trigger off that. So if you're using invoke, uh, PowerShell or invoke Mimi Cats in PowerShell, it's still grabbing these DLLs. There's multiple ways to like skin a cat. And that's kind of like the, yeah. the the way that we've kind of focused our detection on there. But, you know, no, I love it. I mean, this this conversation is uh, I mean, started with Lima Charlie and we're, we'll, we'll circle back to it. But, I mean, there's just so much great information about, you know, really what you just argued was uh, why behavior based um, heuristics is way better than, you know, basically hash signatures or, or strings matches and stuff like that. Yeah, and that's in a good, you know, as a security practitioner, what we always preach is like defense in depth, right? Mm -hmm. but no one ever really has, or not very many people seem to take that same concept. And like, you also have to have like detection in depth. Like it's fine to have like a bunch of signatures. I mean, I'm not I'm not arguing for people to uninstall your AV. Like that would just be oh, completely that'd be completely and totally ridiculous. I mean, could you imagine like someone uninstalling AV, getting breached, and then they get sued, and you've got some lawyer up there, and it's like, well, did you have AV installed? You didn't have AV installed. My grandmother has AV installed on yeah. her machine. That's just negligence. So I'm not like saying that you shouldn't use AV or you shouldn't use these tools for like, you know, signature based stuff. You shouldn't use like your your snort and your Siricata and your like network IDS devices that will operate in the same way. Uh, you have to have like a good mixture of the signature based stuff, your behavior based analytics and your heuristic stuff. And there's even a place for that machine learning stuff. Uh, the machine learning stuff is kind of interesting because everyone thinks like it's a silver bullet but there's a ton of research out there, especially like in the security space, the threats are involving so quick. You can't really do like the type of like supervised machine learning where I'm actually saying, this is bad. This is good. This is bad. This is good. A lot of your companies are using what they call like unsupervised machine learning. So it's just pumping in a bunch of data. There are no tags or labels. And it's kind of like clustering things together. And mm -hmm. then based off those clusterings say, okay, well, you know, this here is bad. This here is good. But what you can do is you can feed and there's, ah, oh man, I, I keep saying because I, I was talking about this the other day and I said I was going to have to find this. But there was a, a 
a talk done at Virus Bulletin, I believe, many, many years ago, where a lot of your AV companies actually, you know, they 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 love to get into like Virus Total because their engines out there and they do get a copy of these samples. So it's a great way for them to get samples to like, you know, fine tune their signatures and the way to detect stuff. So it's a way for them to get data, um, especially the smaller ones that don't have much market penetration. So uh, there was actually an advanced actor out there that for a long time, knowing that a lot of these companies are using machine learning models now to, you know, machine learning is not anything new. Most AV companies like don't have humans write signatures anymore. They have like a machine learning model that writes signatures. You know, CrowdStrike, Silence, all these machines just kind of flipped it on its head. Why have a machine learning model write the signatures? Why well, can just put the machine learning model on the endpoint and just detect all the bad stuff? Saves a step. But uh, what many people don't understand is that these machine learning models, if you feed it in slightly off data, you can actually poison the model mm -hmm. to consider certain things that are malicious no longer malicious. And you can do like Google searches and stuff like that where different, like especially next gen AV like vendors, like all you have to do is make the file size, like just pad your file size where it's over a certain size and they'll just say, ah, it's good. 100% good, buddy, because no one makes malware that's, you know, three megs. Everything's all like 100 kilobytes. Yeah, actually, it's funny you say that. Uh, that SolarWinds event that just recently happened, I mean, that that was how it got through. It was like a 200 meg um, file and and it just got passed through. I mean, obviously there was more to yeah. it. They had to, they had to break the developer, like break through into the development life cycle and all that crap, but it was a 200 meg file and you know, it wasn't, it wasn't getting looked at. Well, and then see, that's the other thing is, you know, I was just talking about, uh, you know, for the Mimi cat stuff, no one really, no one, most threat actors out there, especially the opportunistic ones or even the advanced ones, unless you're like a high end target, which I'm not saying maybe the folks watching this video are not high end targets. They're not going to pay money for like a code signing cert certificate. They might try to steal one or something like that, but most of the time they don't respect you enough to do that. They're just going to go and compile Mimi cats. It's going to be unsigned. They're going to run it. You're not going to detect it because like they'll get on the box. They'll do some recon before they ever run it, figure out that you've got like these security products and they just disable those security products. Uh, yeah. That's actually really common, even in ransomware situations, they get on the box and they say, Oh, they got windows defender. And I know windows defender is going to pick up my malware. So I'm just going to go and disable windows defender. And it's like, all right, problem fixed. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things that even with machine learning, like machine learning stuff is really good at picking out like anomalies. Um, but you can poison those models in such a way that you can easily like bypass them and get around them. And going back to that virus bulletin stuff, there was an advanced adversary out there that actually pumped a bunch of code uh, into their malware and uploaded it to virus total over the course of like a year or two and actually was able to. Uh, Pretty much when they launched their campaign, all of their malware went undetected almost for like a year because they poisoned all the machine learning models because it would have caught them the first go around. So That's quite the commitment. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess I guess when you are an advanced adversary and probably, you know, when you start talking about like nation states or some big like criminal empire, you know, raking in like all this money from ransomware, uh, you probably can pay someone to go and do that type of stuff.